Well, hello, Seacoast Grace. We're glad you're here with us this afternoon. Why don't you stand on your feet, maybe say hello to somebody. If you're watching online, we want you to get involved too.
is on the throne in spite of anything that happens. Amen. So let's just celebrate a God who reigns. Why don't you lift this up with us and say, Turn the 
to something. God is doing something right now. He is up to something. He is up to something. God is doing something right now. He is healing someone. He is saving someone. God is doing something right now. He is healing someone. He is saving someone. God is doing something.
Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that even if we struggle to find something here that we need, we know that if you are the only one who can provide it, that is enough. We thank you for fighting every battle. We thank you for putting promises out ahead of us so that when we come up against problems, we know who has been looking after us. We are so grateful for a God who gives us hope. In a world that tries to steal it from us, we can rest our heart and our hope on you. We ask that in this moment, you meet us here. Meet our hope. Meet the situations that are gathered in this room. Let the words that will be spoken change somebody's life tonight. We thank you for this time. And we ask that you meet us here. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We have some announcements on the screen. Hey, Seacoast, my name is Matt. I want to thank you so much for joining us at Seacoast this weekend. We are so glad you're here. If you're new, I'd like to extend a special welcome your way, and we'd love to get to know you. Feel free to stop by our Welcome Center on the courtyard on your way out to meet some of our friendly staff and awesome volunteers. Now here at Seacoast, we always have plenty of things going on that you guys need to know about. Start with the very first thing. Next weekend, Christ Safari is coming and you're not gonna want to miss it. For those of you who don't know who Christ Safari is, it's a Christian reggae band. It's always a party when they're here. So invite a friend, make sure you're here next week. Next, our men's ministry is kicking off with a three week event entitled Built. Their Pastor Doyle is gonna be sharing with us how he has learned how to build a Christ-centered life. It launches on Thursday, August 12th at 7 to 9 p.m. over in the warehouse. For more information, you can visit our website or talk to Shane Igo. He's the nine foot dude on the patio next to this men's sign. You literally cannot miss him. So if you listen to The Fish or Air One on the radio recently, you may have heard that Jeremy Camp and Torrin Wells have some concerts coming up. Well, those concerts are happening, like right here, like in the seats that you're in. So go buy some tickets over at the Merch House. The concerts are in October and November. Now we understand that life is just difficult and it's definitely too difficult to be doing alone. So with that being said, if you need someone to talk to or you just need someone to pray over you, after service, come up to the stage and there are gonna be some people right down the front here for you. Lastly, one of the reasons our church is so awesome and we can do so many cool things like have Jay Warren Wallace come share with us today is because of your faithfulness. To that, we wanna say thank you. And the continue to give, you can do that online at our website or on the black offering boxes on your way out. Now, as you can see, we have plenty of things going on at Seacoast that you have to be a part of. So make sure you stay up to date with what's coming up by checking out all of the booths on the courtyard and by visiting our website, scdchurch.org. Sorry, I got a little distracted. They had my son being in charge of this, and um, it was a little stressful. So we're, <laughs> we're going to fix it. Hi, Seacoast. My name is Autumn. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. Um, yeah, tons of fun stuff that's going on. One thing um, that we wanted to share with you is that we are going to be doing baptisms in two weekends. So if God, yeah, we're really excited about it. Um, if God has been doing just some awesome stuff in your heart and um, you know that the next step is that you need to share that with your church community, go ahead and go online. Um, we have a sign up there. You can go to, we have like a whole baptism page that'll kind of walk you through what baptism is and how you can get involved in it. So um, two weekends, it's August 15th, I believe is the date. Um, so don't miss out on that. Um, today, we have a guest speaker, Jay Warner Wallace, um, and he is just an amazing guy. I have just gotten the privilege, my husband and I have um, been hosting him this weekend, and so we are getting like counseling and all sorts of stuff. Um, he has an incredible message for you today, um, so just sit down in your seats and just be ready to like, your brains are just going to start like firing on all cylinders. So please welcome with me, Jay Warner Wallace. I felt bad for Isaac. He's like trying to plug this silly thing in. And of course, it's just slightly too far. I think we set it up so he could fail, basically. I felt bad for him. Um, okay. I'm going to jump in with you and talk about something that uh, plagued me as an early believer. I didn't become a Christian until I was about 35. So I, I was not raised in the church, didn't know anybody who was in the church. It just was not my thing. By the way, I love it when we have somebody here who is uh, uh, translating, sitting right below me right now. Because I'm going to talk so fast, there's no way she's going to keep up. I'm just going to keep up all kinds of big words. I'm using every big theological word. Theological, theological, theological. <laughs> Woo. That's good. 
Yeah, most of my career has been here in Southern California, and I've been investigating uh, cold cases. These are just unsolved murders, okay? So if you like uh, unsolved murders, if you like Dateline, for example, I think all of my cases now are on Dateline or on the ID channel. So you can kind of see some of the stuff we've been doing over the years. But uh, when I first started this work, I was not a Christian, and it was my wife. And we were together for 18 years before we became Christians. And the way in for me was I had to know, is this true evidentially? In other words, did I have any good reason to believe that what is claimed in the New Testament actually occurred in history? And so I'm going to walk through some of that process with you, all right? Now, my son is in this job now. He works here in the same agency that I was in for years. He wears the same uniform that I wore. Uh, he has the same name tag I had because we don't change our names. We just use the same name over and over and over again. So his name is Jim Wallace, and I gave him some of my uniforms when I retired because he his name is Jim Wallace. It was easy. And, and then my dad did the same thing for me before, before I came on. His name is also Jim Wallace. We've been at this agency for 60 years last June, um, just doing the same work. Now, when you do this kind of investigative work, at some time, at some point, someone's going to ask you, well, what did you learn? How did you learn it? Right? How did you, what did you decide? What did you investigate? And so a couple of years ago, I was asked to do this in a movie that was called God's Not Dead 2. And we had six minutes, right? And I was lucky. They, they actually um, told me I could write the scene myself, so that makes, should make it easier, right? But I only had six minutes to make a case that took me a year almost to investigate. How do you do that in six minutes? Well, we're going to try to do it today in 30 minutes, but I'm going to do it backwards. I'm going to do it in a way that, because I was investigating whether or not the New Testament was telling me anything true. But to be honest, when I first started, I was not going to read your stupid New Testament. I mean, everyone's got something they want you to read, right? Mormons come by my house all the time. They want me to read their Book of Mormon. I'm not reading any of that nonsense. So I want to kind of work it backwards. What if you didn't trust the New Testament at all and you weren't willing to look at it? Could you still make a case for the historicity and deity of Jesus? I think you could. Now, I, I'm writing about this in, in, a, in a new book called Person of Interest, which comes out in September. And so I, I took an approach in this book that I think is different than I've ever seen anyone else take, but it was part of my process to determine if Christianity was true. I want you to imagine a scenario with me, a future dystopian universe in which on earth somebody has now collected all the manuscripts, all of the New Testaments, all of the Bibles, and has burned all of them. So there's not a single remaining, imagine this could be, possibly be done, not a single remaining New Testament, not a single remaining Bible, They've all been destroyed. How could you know anything about Jesus if every manuscript had been destroyed? Well, it's kind of like when you work a crime scene, right? I've had crime scenes where you've got good evidence in the crime scene, so you can actually put a tape around it and you can collect that evidence. But I've also had cases where there was no crime scene. Why? Because like say a husband kills one of these episodes on Dateline. A husband kills his wife, then claims that she ran off and reports her as a missing and we don't investigate it as a murder, don't even take pictures of the house, nothing, five years goes by, and now we're suddenly stuck investigating it as a murder because she never returned. And we have no crime scene, no evidence in a crime scene. It's empty. Did a felony even occur there? You might have a suspect. Maybe you think, okay, you know, the, the husband, I suspect the husband did it. Really? How do you know he's a felon? How do you know he's a person of interest if you've got no evidence? She's not even have a body. The body never was recovered. And there's no evidence in the crime scene. Well, that's the approach I wanted to take with Scripture. In other words, if there was no evidence from the New Testament itself, could I still make a case with an empty crime scene? Turns out you could. Look, when I'm in front of a jury and they're asking the question, well, how are you going to make this evidentially? I always tell them, look, every crime is part of a timeline. There's a period of time before the crime occurs, and there's a period of time after the crime occurs. Does that make sense? Okay. That middle spot right there, where that's, that's a day that was a bad day. It's as if on that day something explosive occurred. A bomb went off, and then and and, and she vanished. Now, the question, of course, is I have no evidence in the crime scene about what that bomb looked like, but every bomb is preceded by a fuse. And as that fuse burns toward, you know, tensions rise and husbands and wives begin to argue and fight, then eventually something bad happens and there's shrapnel all over the place from the exploding bomb. Does that make sense? 
So when I'm asking the question, what happened in the middle? You don't have any evidence in the crime scene, but I do have everything from the fuse and everything from the fallout. And I can make a case and demonstrate what happened at the point of the crime just from the fuse and the fallout. A bunch of stuff happened leading up to the crime, and then a bunch of stuff, behaviors, for example, behavior, plans that were set in place, tensions that were arising, and then afterwards, a bunch of behavior that points back to what actually happened. This is how we make cases in front of juries when we have no evidence from a crime scene. Does that make sense? Same thing could be done with Jesus. We have this explosive event which inaugurates the new, new era, the common era, right? So if you divided history from B.C. to A.D. or you divided it from B.C.E. to C.E., either way, something happens right there in the middle that divides history. What is it? And if I had nothing from the New Testament, if I just took away all the evidence in the crime scene, I would still have a fuse and I would still have fallout. And that would tell me what happened at that point in history. Does that make sense? So I just wrote a book where I'm just talking about the evidence from history and the fuse and the fallout. Now today, all we're going to talk about is one chapter of a 10-chapter book, okay? I'll be teaching this at Biola. I know it's going to be at least an 18-hour course. So, we're going to give you the 30-minute version and only about 20 minutes left. So, let's get moving, okay? Here we go. I want to just talk about this one aspect of the fuse, a spiritual fuse in history that's leading up to the appearance of Jesus of Nazareth. I'll give it to you on a larger timeline. So, here's our timeline. Did you realize that before Jesus showed up, there were all kinds of ancient people groups who were worshiping all kinds of ancient gods? We call most of these mythologies now. But these all precede Jesus. And there are people who think that Jesus never even lived because they recognize that there are some similarities between Jesus and some of the predecessors of Jesus in the pantheon of gods. And these people, I call them Jesus mythers. They would say basically Jesus never really lived. Now, I've taken students, I was a high school pastor for years, I took students up to Berkeley to help them interact with atheists because you figure at UC Berkeley, that's where you're going to meet your most skeptical people. <laughs> So I would bring my students to, to Berkeley, and we would spend a week there, and we would invite atheists into our group to give presentations. One atheist came into our group, and he told the students, I'm going to describe for you somebody, and I want you to look at the description and tell me who I'm describing. And he offered this description to my group, okay? So here's his description. That sounds suspiciously like Jesus of Nazareth, doesn't it? Twelve companions, disciples promised to work miracles, died, rose three days later, born and has a, from a virgin, attended by shepherds. Well, someone of our, our kids knew better, but the, the, the guy who was giving the presentation, that's not Jesus. That is Mithras, a Persian deity that starts about 400 years prior to Jesus who then coexists. As a matter of fact, if you were to dig down through any basilica, any cathedral in the city of Rome, you dig down one layer, you'll find the earliest Christian uh, worship centers. But if you dig down one more layer, you will find Mithraic temples because this is the predecessor of Jesus. That was his claim. All of this sounds like Jesus, but in fact, it's not Jesus at all. This is all Mithras. Jesus is a copycat savior like many others who allegedly were born of a virgin, who allegedly rose and after they died. Is that true? That's, that causes a great deal of skepticism for young people, trust me. Just search the internet on this, you'll see this is not like some crazy claim I'm making. But it turns out if you were to investigate Mithras, you would know that most of this description is not actually true to begin with. So I'm just going to cross out the stuff that's not. It turns out that really the only similarity between Mithras and Jesus are those, those two in the middle. That's just the way it is. No one actually usually does the homework to see if that's true, but I have done the homework and Mithras is not that similar to Jesus. But he does possess those two similarities. Well, it turns out if you were to study all of the ancient mythologies, you would find out that they have about 15 common characteristics. All of, so I read through all of them from the Southern Americas, from the Aztecs, all the way to Asia, 
Read all of the mythologies of gods and you will discover about 15 common characteristics that seem to reappear in every mythology. Isn't that weird? I mean, they're separated by oceans, yet these same 15 common characteristics sometimes reappear. Why would that be the case? Well, let me show them to you. I'm a good Baptist, so I've got all of them starting with the same letter, okay? That's how we do it, right? Three, three points and a promise. That's what every Baptist pastor does. So here we go. I'm not going to go through all 15. I'm just going to give you a couple so you can get the idea, okay? For example, there are a number of ancient mythologies that are said that the deity appears after some prophecy or somehow he was foretold. Now, I don't know why that's common to all of these, except that it seems to me that the ancients had a common expectation that if God is God, like we should hear him coming somehow, shouldn't we? And so that usually comes out in some version of the mythology. That doesn't surprise me, though. That's kind of a common expectation I would see of the ancients. So Zoroaster, for example, is allegedly foretold. Uh, many of these are said to have a royal lineage of some type. Well, that doesn't surprise me either because the ancients thought that God was somehow better or, or, or more powerful or a higher stature than humans. And the only people they had in their world that had that kind of higher stature was, was the royals. And so they often would associate their deity with some form of royalty. That does sound, though, like, you know, King David is in the lineage of Jesus. So you can see how there's a kind of a parallel there, right? Give you another one. Um, most of these folks, when they appear on planet Earth, they appear uh, in some surprising supernatural way. But I think the ancients thought, hey, if God is God, he's going to do everything in a surprising supernatural way, including appear and probably die and probably everything in the middle is going to be unnatural in some way because God is not of natural order. He's a supernatural being. So even this, I don't think is that surprising because it seems like the kind of common expectation you would have if you were just thinking about God generally. And it turns out that there's a bunch of these. I'll get the list here on the wall. I'm not going to be able to go through all of them with you, but I, that's why I wrote a book. And so if you look at this, this is a pretty long list. Now I'm going to go ahead and give you the list of our, the graph of all of the, uh, these are the deities. Here's the history that's going to fuse the, uh, the spiritual fuse, and I'm going to place the deities on the fuse in the order in which they occur prior to Jesus, and I'm going to place above them the attributes they possess that are, are part of that common 15. So here they go. As it burns, you'll see that each deity, as it appears in history, possesses some number of those 15 common attributes. Not all of them, though. I said there's 15 that I can see as I read through these. I'm the only one who's done this kind of work, so I don't know if you might spot a 16th. But I know this, that not everyone possesses every, de every um, attribute. But the ones who possess the most are these four right here. These four deities possess more of those 15, like nine or 10 of the attributes. So these are the ones who look the most alike Yet you'll see that although I might say I appeared supernaturally on planet Earth, how I appear supernaturally can be very different. So if you're saying, hey, well, look, Buddha's got 10 of those attributes and Zoroaster has 10 of those attributes. No one's claiming Buddha is copied from Zoroaster. And if you look at the two stories, they are markedly different, okay? So just because you might share common characteristics with some prior mythology does not mean you're borrowed from that mythology or that you're a copycat of that mythology. It just means these are the common expectations that humans have about God that find their way into the mythologies. Does that make sense so far, folks? Now, some of these are, are like, there's one here that everyone has. So, for example, every single one of these deities has the power to work miracles. Duh! If your God can't work miracles, he's probably not a god. So it doesn't surprise me that everyone thinks their God is supernatural. Like, really? Okay. But now, interestingly, not everyone appears miraculously. Most do, but not everyone. Not only that, not everyone can defeat death. Most can, but not every one of them. And not everyone can give eternal life, but most can. These are the most common features. I just gave you four. I gave you the four deities that, are, that have the most common features, and I gave you the four common features that are most prevalent. Follow what I just did? What's interesting is, let's go back to our list. So here's our list. Each group in history 
expect something of God, but not everything of God, until one emerges in history. The only one that possesses every attribute of our expectations of God is Jesus of Nazareth. That's interesting to me. Why is it that this guy is the one who possesses everything? C.S. Lewis puts it this way. He says, you know, the story of Christ is simply a true myth. When he uses the word myth, he's, just, he's talking about the, 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 the narratives that we have about God. But this is a true myth, a myth working on us in the same way as the others, but with this tremendous difference in that it really happened. And one must be content to accept it in the same way. Remember that it's God's myth where the others are men's myths. In other words, the pagan stories are God expressing himself through the minds of the ancients, the poets and writers of the antiquity, using such images as he found there. Look, I'm a guy in the, you know, 3,000 years before Jesus. I'm going to use whatever my world is to, to try my best to describe what I think God would be like. While Christianity is God expressing himself through what we call reality, real things. And this is exactly what Paul is telling people on Mars Hill. Paul goes to Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17, and he tells the people there in Athens, he says, you folks, you are very religious. He says, I observe that you are very religious in all respects, for while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship... I also found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. You are worshiping even the things you don't know. It's like Paul is trying to say, hey, you know what? You guys worship all kinds of stuff, but I'm here to tell you the truth because we encountered the living God and he demonstrated us his deity by rising from the grave. It's like, hey, I I get it. You guys have got ideas about God for thousands of years. I'm here now to reveal to you the one God who possesses every attribute you could ever have imagined. He also says that death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type, Adam is a type of him, of the Messiah who was to come. A type? What is he saying there? Let me give you another picture of Jesus here, okay? He's saying he's a type of him. So here's a description from Scripture. Okay, I think you recognize that description. The same class at Berkeley, if I was to say, okay, I'm gonna describe somebody for you here at class, who am I describing? I think most of them would say that's Jesus, but it's not Jesus, that's Moses. A type of him who was to come. I can give you another description here. Not Jesus. That is Joshua. And it turns out there's a history, not a pagan history of of mythologies, but a history that precedes Jesus in which there's description after description after description of what appears to be Jesus when none of these descriptions are even similar to each other and none of them are Jesus. These are the types in Jewish history, the, the predecessors to Jesus who came so that an entire people group who knew a, a Messiah was promised really should have known what he would look like from all of these types. And it turns out, just like with the pagans, the only full, robust description involving all of those descriptions is the appearance of Jesus who personifies everything that... Why would God do it this way? Why would God take these two different groups, one that is thinking deeply about the nature of God and one that is reading deeply the description and anticipation of God, why would these two things be used by God prior to Jesus? Well, I think it comes down to that word expectations because expectations require two things, right? Expectations require expectors and expecteds. Let me give it to you by way of a story. So part of my career, I worked undercover for four years. My son's doing that right now. He's in his undercover tour right now. And sometimes in an undercover tour, what you're doing is we work in career criminals in a back room. We call it the back room at our agency. And so what we're doing is we're out doing surveillances of people we think are going to do crimes. Now, it's always better if you have information about the bad guy rather than the area the bad guy is working. So for example, if someone tells you, oh, I know this drug addict and he's doing garage burglaries, 
excellent. I just have to go to wherever the drug addict is and sit on him, and eventually he's going to do another burglary. He's going to go to jail. If on the other hand, I don't know who's doing it, but I know I have a bunch of burglaries in a neighborhood, then I'm doing what's called a geographic uh, surveillance, and those stink because I, I, could get, I, I can't cover every street. So we're doing one of these lousy geographic surveillances years ago in our West End because we know we're getting hit for burglaries. And sure enough, we're about six or seven hours into the surveillance, about two o'clock in the afternoon, and I hear a call go out on dispatch because I'm listening to the radio. I'm in a playing car, and I'm in playing clothes, and I haven't, you know, I look pretty ragged, and I'm sitting there, but I hear the dispatch. There's a burglary that occurred two blocks away, just two blocks away. A guy had gone out from his house, his apartment, had gone to the market. When he came back from the market, he discovered a burglary. And I was like, oh, how could that happen? I missed it by two blocks. So I jumped the call and I drove over to him and I'm in a playing car. I just wanted to jump out and say, hey, what did you see? Did you see any car? Maybe I can get enough detail before the patrol officer arrives because he's waiting for a patrol officer. And I jump out of my car and I'm looking like this. Okay, because that's the way I looked back then. And so I walk up to this guy and he won't give me the time of day. And then the, the patrol officer finally shows up and he comes out of his car and now suddenly this guy's telling him everything. Why is that happening? Why is it that he was ignoring me yet being cooperative? We're both police officers. Well, because when he called the police, he had a certain expectation. I did not meet his expectation. So he just blew me off. Make sense? This dude, though, now meets the expectation of the expector. The more the um, expected meets the expectations of the expector, the better the response. Are you getting it? So why would you be surprised that Jesus arrives, God comes in the form of a human, meeting the expectations of expectors? So let's go back to our our crime scene here. I always ask this question in any crime. Why did the crime occur in that blue zone? Like that's where the crime occurs. That's where she goes missing. Why didn't she go missing earlier? A year earlier, six months earlier. Why not two months later? Why is she going missing there in that blue zone? Well, it turns out that's an important question. Timing will help you identify a killer. It's not just about, you know, where did it occur? It's often about when did it occur? Does that make sense? So let me give you something I developed. I call this red zoning because I love that. You know who Scott Hansen is at the Red Zone NFL Network? Scott's a friend, and he endorses this next book. He's also an apologetics geek. I don't know if you guys knew that or not. Yeah, he is a big-time apologetics guy. So uh, I, I, because of him, I call this red zoning. And so what I do here is I ask the question. Okay, so she went missing at that point. That's when the bomb went off. But that long fuse was burning, and there's a bunch of evidence, a bunch of things that occurred as that fuse was burning. That makes sense? So now the question is, um, what, you know, what, so let's just take this back out again. This crime occurred in our city, so I ended up investigating it. But it wouldn't have occurred in our city if they weren't living in our city. And it turned out they weren't living in our city until they moved into our city. And they moved into our city because prior to this, a business, a car uh, uh, repair shop, that's where Steve wanted to work. Okay, great. So he, that, that shop was not there until that date. So this crime could not have occurred in our city until he, he didn't move into our city until this date. So that means this crime is not going to occur in our city with this little information I have so far until this red zone. This is the red zone in which the crime can occur in our city because he wasn't in our city until this time. Does that make sense? Okay. But there's more to that because he actually wanted to get rid of her by burning her body with acid in a barrel. He didn't own a barrel of this nature, but he had a friend who did. That friend didn't get that barrel until way back then when he got it from his employer. And he didn't give it to Steve until right here. So now I have to have the barrel in place and I'm in my city. So now these two things create a smaller red zone. And he had to buy the acid. And it turns out that we had a business that moved into our city about you know, a year before. So that city, that business was in place. And then I found the receipts in which I see when he bought the acid. So now I know that he is going to operate within this red zone. He has the barrel and he has the acid. So now the red zone's smaller. But he had a deadline to meet because she uh, had gotten pregnant. Tammy had gotten pregnant, and he did not want that baby being born. He already had a kid he was taking care of, he had to pay for, from a prior girl. He did not want this one to. So now he's going to have to work in front of that deadline. Not only that, he didn't want anyone to know that she was pregnant. So he he needed to, to do this before she was showing. 
And as a matter of fact, then she tells him that she's going to take a flight and go tell her parents in Northern California about the pregnancy. He doesn't want that to happen, so now he's got to work in front of that deadline. And sure enough, where is my red zone now? It's right here. I've got everything I need, and the deadline is approaching. And where does she go missing? Right there. That red zone tells me who's involved because it's unique to him. His deadlines are unique to him. His prior conditions are unique to him. Now I can demonstrate to a jury why he's my guy. Does that make sense? Red zoning. Could you do the same thing in history? Yeah. So we talked about these deities. I'm just going to put them on the wall. If God wants to arrive when humans have a common expectation of what God might look like so I can meet the expectations of the expecters, it makes sense to me that God would arrive when these deities are being worshipped. And there's a starting and an ending time for most of these deities. I'm putting them on the timeline right now. So you can see when each deity begins to be worshipped and when each deity ends being worshipped. If I'm going to arrive meeting the expectations of the most I can meet, I'm going to want to arrive in the overlap. Does that make sense? So that means that if God wants to arrive and meet the expectations of all of these divergent groups across the planet who all worship different gods, I've got to arrive in that red zone. There's another factor of the fuse, though, we didn't talk about, and that is that if I wanted to arrive at a time when the entire world was aligned so that the message of my arrival could travel fast and far, then you'd be wise to arrive during the Roman Empire because it takes over everything else and it changes the common languages. Rome doesn't begin until it seizes control of the region of Italy, and then it establishes a common language built on a common Etruscan alphabet and common Greek language being used popularly, and it expands that out of the entire region, over the entire known world. And it produces more bridges, roads, in tunnels than any empire preceding it because it was moving its armies and you could not move them around sharp edges. So the Romans says, no, we're not doing that. We're going through things. We're going over things. They built more bridges and tunnels than anybody else to move their machinery. So now you had the very roads that Paul is going to walk in the book of Acts, which were not available until the Roman Empire. And you have this period of all kinds of developments in terms of mail systems, in terms of stability. The empire is going to fall, so you only have it for a short time, and you have a 200-year called the Pax Romana of global peace, relatively global peace, in which you now can express an, a message, and it can travel peacefully, and the resources you used to use for war, they're now using, again, for roads and tunnels and bridges to help you spread the message. But that means my red zone is smaller, Finally, there's a prophetic fuse because the prophecies of the Jewish people are saying that something is going to happen. A Messiah is going to arrive. And Daniel says that that Messiah is going to arrive sometime between the proclamation to restore Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. This is what Daniel says. It's his prophecy. But that's a period of time we can now put on our timeline. And there it is. And where is our red zone now? It's right here. If I didn't know anything about Jesus of Nazareth, I should know that something is going to happen here. And it turns out that is the exact place where all of our calendars divide. Is that a coincidence? Or is there a red zone that's very specific to one suspect? He accounts for the, the conditions of that red zone. It turns out that this is the guy who is your person of interest. And we already know who falls in that. That is Jesus of Nazareth. Now, here's my whole point. Scripture points to this. New Testament says, I love the fact, I'm not somebody who would ever rush to Scripture as a non-believer, but isn't it interesting that Scripture describes the world the way it really is? That's helpful to me. And it turns out that we should know from Scripture that, hey, you know what? You should be able to look around at your natural environment and deduce that there is a God. We know that from Paul. It tells us this in Romans 1. There's no one's got an excuse. You can tell as creatures in the creation that there is a creator. Not only that, it says that eternity is in the heart of every one of us. This is no surprise. Ecclesiastes is written by Solomon. 
This is an ancient king who wrote this book saying that, yeah, all these groups have eternity in their heart. They're all hoping there's something more. They're all thinking hard about the nature of God. And we know that God will arrive in the fullness of time. And you might have been wondering, what does that even mean? Well, now you know what it means. Because it was at the right time when the fuse had burned to that right specific red zone that Jesus actually appears. And when he appears, everything changes. Do you realize the fallout? We're not going to be able to talk about it. I do just talks on the fallout side of this. We're not going to talk about those today. But in terms of literature, no historical figure has been written about more than Jesus of Nazareth. No, there's not even a close second. If you go to the Congress, Library of Congress, not a close second to Jesus of Nazareth. Let's do a Google book search globally, not a close second to Jesus of Nazareth. This guy's been written about more than anyone on any continent at any point in history since his arrival. Not only that, most of our fiction globally is based on figures that resemble Jesus. There's an entire genre of literature known as Christ figures. This is being studied. Do you watch Marvel comics? They're all some version of Jesus. Superman is a very strong version of Jesus. This is a copy called Christ figuring. There are no Buddha figures in literature, but there are Christ figures in literature. Isn't that interesting? It turns out you could take the entire, this, this back row of grayed out figures are just the non-Christians in the first 300 years who wrote about Jesus. If all you did was look at the non-Christians in the first 300 years, you could reconstruct the entire story of Jesus from the non-Christians who wrote about him. I've done this in the book. Really? You think you can get rid of Jesus by just destroying the New Testament? No, you need to destroy the history of literature largely and specifically all non-Christian literature in the first 300 years. You're not going to get rid of Jesus that easily. And you can reconstruct the story of Jesus, not just from that, from the arts. Look, my bachelor's degree is in design, okay? My master's degree is in architecture, and then I became a police officer. <laughs> so I love art history. And if you just research through art history, in every nation across the planet, no one has been depicted more than Jesus of Nazareth. Every art genre across history, no one has been more influential than Jesus of Nazareth. Every master, say, top five masters in popism, top five masters in Dadaism, whatever it is in the last hundred years, just Google the first top five, top three masters. Every one of them will have penciled, etched, painted, sculpted Jesus of Nazareth. There is no other historical figure who has been more illustrated or referenced as inspiration than Jesus of Nazareth. And if all you did was take the art from the first four or five hundred years, I, can, I did this in the book, I reconstructed every episode of the Gospel of Mark. Unless you're willing to destroy the buildings where this art resides, you cannot erase the history of Jesus. He's that influential. It's not just that. You like music? What music do you like? K-pop, right? Do you all like K-pop right now? <laughs> you guys see um, Crash Landing on You on Netflix? Who has seen Crash Landing? It's a Korean romance. Raise your hand if you've seen Crash Landing on You. You all need to watch it. It's really good. <laughs> I binged it, okay? I was addicted to it, okay? But it's all got Korean pop music in it, right? Do you realize that if you Google, look, if you're, we played worship this morning, but if you like music that has been written down on musical notation, you could make a Christ follower for that because there was no musical notation until Christ followers invented it. Minor scales, major scales, Christ followers. Harmonies, Christ followers. Most of the instruments we use in any context, Christ followers. Top 100 artists in the last 100 years on Billboard or IMDb or Rolling Stone magazine. Google them. Make a comprehensive list. It'll be about 150 deep because everyone's got a different view, okay? Every genre is represented there. I'm talking all the way from, from pop to, to, to rap. To, it's all there. I went through every catalog of those 150 artists. All but two have sung songs about Jesus. No other historical figure can make claim to that. No one. The history of music can be, you can reconstruct the story of Jesus just from the hymns sung in the first 400 years 
I'm talking about the details of Jesus' life, not just that we love him and that he loves us, but the details of his life can be reconstructed from music. Unless you're willing to destroy the history of music, you will not erase Jesus from uh, history. It gets even better, folks, because he had an even bigger influence in an unexpected place. Education and science is dominated by Jesus and his followers. I should have done a science talk with you guys today. I'm telling you, modern universities that we are all thinking are anti-Christian right now, where do you think those things came from? They came from the monastery systems that then evolved into the cathedral systems that then evolved into the three first modern universities, all established by Christians in Bologna, Paris, and Oxford. From there came two dozen of the next generation of universities. The top 15 universities in the world today were founded by Christians. They may not even acknowledge Christ anymore, but they were founded by Christians. If you just visited their campuses and looked at their buildings and charters, you could reconstruct the story of Jesus from just the campuses where his image still appears. You know the sciences? We have this thing called the scientific revolution in the 16th and 17th centuries. You realize that is 99% Christ followers, right? Science explodes under Christianity. Oh, everyone was a Christ follower in the 15th and 16th. No. There was Asia. There was Persia. There were lots of different places where there were high density populations in which science did not explode. It exploded in Christendom. Why? More Nobel uh, science laureates are Christian than any other group. It's not even close. You can take this to private writings. Do you realize the science fathers, the, the initiators of every modern scientific discipline from quantum mechanics all the way back to chemistry, Christ followers. And if you took their personal notes and just read them, you could get the most robust reconstruction of the Jesus story from any category of culture. Are you willing to destroy the history of science? I used to say, hey, if a scientist didn't say it, I don't trust it. Are you willing to trust what scientists have said about Jesus? Because the vast majority are Jesus followers. And finally... World religions all hat tip Jesus. Every religion that follows Christianity mentions Jesus. And the ones that preceded Christianity and still exist today have embraced Jesus in some way. If you're a Hindu, you know about Jesus. If you're a Buddhist, you know about Jesus. Your leaders are talking about him as though he's one of yours. If you're a Muslim, he's still the most important prophet in the system, the one who will return to judge the living and the dead. That's in Islam. You can reconstruct the story of Jesus just from the scriptures and writings of the leaders of the other systems. You cannot do this for any other religious figure. How is it that this is the guy who is the person of interest in history? This dude, this knucklehead, how can he be the most important person in the history of persons? He's nobody. Do you realize that little red zone I showed you, that 100-year red zone where in which Jesus appears? These guys also appeared. Yet you don't even know any of these people, probably a few you might know. These are from all over the world, the most important people in the first century, and most of them don't matter. No one changed their calendar for these guys. These are the world leaders that no one changed their calendar for. These are the other religious figures, deities, and leaders that no one changed their calendar for. These are the other men who said they were the Jewish Messiah. Do you realize we've got 1,200 years worth of other people who said they were the Messiah after Jesus? No, you didn't know that. Why? Because they're not. <laughs> and instead, it's this guy, Jesus of Nazareth, born in some nowhere little village, raised in another nowhere little village. Let's think about that. In the middle of nowhere, he only had three years to do his ministry. He never moved even more than 200 miles from where he started, okay? This is the guy who changes history. This guy who was rejected by the people who thought they knew better, the people who were in power, who was hunted by the powerful, rejected by the religious. The people who loved him abandoned him. The people who said they were with him, they denied him. They, they walked away, they betrayed him. Think about this. This is the guy, the guy who was falsely accused, this is the guy who changed his history. The guy who had no way to develop a large platform. He had no social media. He had no Twitter account. 
But he never even led uh, an army, never led a nation, never wrote a book, never wrote a concert, never had that kind of impact. This is the guy who never even had a family of much stature, and even part of his family started to deny him. He was never married, never had children. He never even owned anything. This is the guy who suffered that trial, who then when he was finally executed, had to borrow a grave. This is the guy who changes history. How can that be? How can this be the person of interest in history? No one should have had this impact on history that Jesus of Nazareth had. No one. So maybe he's just not a person to begin with. It could be that this is what what explains all of it. I want you to think about that. He spoke as though he was God. He realized that the prophets would say, the Lord your God says, the Lord Almighty proclaims. Today the Lord your God says. Every prophet starts that way. Jesus never starts this way. Jesus always starts, I tell you, verily, verily, I say to you. The prophets speak for God. Jesus speaks as God. That's different, right? It's not just that. He told us he wasn't from this world. He told us he didn't come from us. He was from God. He said even the things that belong to God actually belong to him like angels. Really? He was, say he was equal. Who could do this and get away with this? You realize if you were a man in the first century in Judaism and you claimed to be God and you accepted the worship of other humans as though you were God, that was blasphemy. Yet his entire life, all he did was accept the worship of others. How do you get away with this? I mean, he even used God's name. They wanted to kill him for that. Look, he had everything, the authority to do all kinds of things, the authority to create. Only God has the authority to create, right? He has the authority to forgive. Who can forgive sins except for God? Who can give you eternal life except for God? Who's gonna come to judge the living and the dead except for God? Yet Jesus is said to have the authority to do all of these things. Even the Muslims believe that. This is what's interesting about Jesus. He's not a person at all. Yeah, he had outsized impact. No human should have this kind of impact on history. But if God exists, wouldn't you expect him, if he enters into his creation, to have this kind of impact on his creation? If you're sitting in this room and you're like I was when I first sat in a church because my wife asked me to come, there's a lot of you here, right, that, for that reason. I'll be honest. The church globally, and the church, not globally, but nationally, is, is women-dominated. Did you realize that's about 60, 40 women in church? It's been said that if you can get women to come to church, you won't necessarily get their husbands. But if you can get husbands to come to church, you'll probably get their wives. Why is that? A lot of you men are here right now because this is part of your routine. You'll take your wives to nice restaurants you don't like either, but you love your wife. (laughs) And so here you are in church, because you don't think this is true. Really? Everything I valued as an atheist, everything, literature, arts, music, education, science, was all dependent upon Jesus of Nazareth. Without him, we don't have it the way we have it today, yet you want to continue to deny him? That has to stop today. Because Jesus is not a person of interest. He is the God who ought to interest you. And if you haven't been interested, shame on you. You're in a good place. You're in a great church that can help you take another step. Now, look, before I leave you, I just want to say a couple things. Some of you are taking, I saw take notes, take pictures of the screens. I'm going to send you videos, okay? I'm going to send you a video on the reliability of Scripture, on the reliability of the resurrection, on the nature of truth, and on uh, the existence of God evidence from science for the existence of God. I'm going to send those to you. Here's how you're going to get it. I, this is not my choice in numbers. There's a lot of sixes in this text, but if you'll just text um, this, this number 66866, one word, you're going to text that word detective to me, and then I will send you back a link that has all of those videos, plus PDF files and MP3s. Look, I sell books, but as an atheist, I was always skeptical of people who were selling books. I am not here to manipulate you into buying a book. Don't care if you buy the book. Yeah, I've got books. I'll sign books today. Don't care if you buy. I want to send you some stuff for free. And I say that because I I, I write books. And it's awkward for me. And I have a book coming out next month or two months from now called uh, Person of Interest. 
And I'm going to ask those of you who are book readers to help me with this. We're forming a launch team next week. On Tuesday, I will send out emails to people who want to be part of the launch team. You can learn more about that at personofinterestbook.com. And I will um, send you a bunch of free stuff from that book, including videos, Bible inserts. You're going to get a bunch of Bible inserts from me anyway, just for texting me. So I want you to have stuff to help you grow. But if you don't think this is a good place to grow, why do you think we're doing baptisms here? We want to start you on a journey. That start, that your justification as a Christian before God takes place in a moment, but your sanctification will take the rest of your life. Amen. And you will see God's spirit, the same spirit that drew you into this room that maybe hopefully is compelling you today to put your faith and trust in Christ is the same spirit that will change your life going forward. And that's what we do here. And so if you haven't as a man accepted your responsibility and your family as the spiritual leader. The prodigal son story, the son comes back to a loving father who is supposed to be a picture of God for us. Men, have you been a picture of God for your family? It's not too late. Don't leave here today until you sign up for built. Not every church does this. Every church needs to. Women, kick your husbands in the butt (laughs) and make them go. Let's pray. Father, we know that uh, we can do such a better job of leading in our families and of embracing what is true and help us to be more thoughtful about what we say is so important to us help us to take a step of faith and be a leader for you in our community in our family we pray this in the name of our precious your precious son our precious savior jesus of nazareth we pray this in your name in his name and everyone here says amen Amen. thanks I, I kind of feel like my brain just got bigger. Like I, and I want to be able to say all those things the same way that he said them. So I think I'm going to need to do some studying. Um, Jay J. Warner Wallace is going to be out in the lobby. Um, like he said, his books are for sale. Um, they're incredible. Um, and so I would highly encourage you to just grab one and kind of continue to grow your brain. Um, But he'll also be out there and um, super fun guy to talk to. So I would encourage you to go and and talk to him, have him sign your book. Um, Thank you so much for coming today. Um, We just pray that God is working in your life, um, that he is calling you to take new steps with him, um, to learn more about him. So um, yeah, we just pray that you have a great week. Um, So go in peace. Have a great day.